Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Studying God's Word, the Scripture, requires time, it requires prayer, and it requires training in order that we understand how the Word of God is comprised both grammatically, according to the language, and according to literary devices that the Holy Spirit inspired, for example, Isaiah to use in order to convey his truth to the reader. And the more you become familiar with these devices, these methodologies, then you're going to understand the message of the Word of God in a clearer way. When you look, for example, and we are in the midst of our study of chapter 14 of the prophecy of Isaiah, and if you just take time and go through some of the most common commentators on the Internet, and I'm talking about doing a search of Isaiah chapter 14 commentary, you will find that in one section of Isaiah they interpret it this way, and then they go to another section within that same chapter or, or passage, and they see no connection with what was just said. This ought not be. And the reason for this is that so often they do not understand the nature of prophecy, of Hebrew poetry, of the method that the Word of God employs to give to the reader revelation. Well, look with me to that chapter, Isaiah chapter 14, and we're going to begin in a moment with verse verse 16. And notice what the prophet has done. We have seen that for the last few verses in our previous video, we know for certain that the reference was to Satan. We talked about Hallel ben Shachar, which is the praise, and that's what he was supposed to do, to give praise to God with a priority, first in the morning. But he didn't want to do that. We saw where he wanted to, to exalt his throne over God. He didn't want to give praise, but he wanted to be praised. And instead of supporting the kingdom of God, he wanted to establish his own kingdom. And we saw last week at the conclusion of our study that he is going to be brought down, that he is going to be defeated, and that he is going to not only be defeated, but he is going to be in eternal shame and contempt. We're going to continue just that type of study, as the Word of God continues to speak more about Satan, his defeat, and the consequences of those who side, who join him, who enter into an agreement with him. And secondly, one of the things we see here is how there is going to be certain events that were relevant for the time of Isaiah or shortly thereafter. And these events which are prophesied, they give us an encouragement. As I've shared last week and in other passages that use the same literary device, when we see God's faithfulness to reveal to us an event, and that event that he prophesied came to pass the fact that that event was placed into the context of speaking about a much future event dealing with the destruction of 
the Antichrist empire, and those who belong to Satan and Satan's judgment that he's going to eternally receive, all those other events, they show a confirmation. They give us a validity to understand that what God has said about the distant future, because the close future, it was fulfilled, it took place, we can be assured in that same way that that final prophetic truth, that final event, the destruction of Satan, will also take place. It's very similar to what we read in Matthew 24, when Messiah began to speak about the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple itself that took place in 70 A.D., and when we see and know that that took place 40 years after Messiah prophesied it, we can be assured that what he continued to teach concerning the last days, that which is even in our future, that too is worthy to believe. So let's begin Isaiah 14 and verse 16. We read here, and they see you, and unto you they observed. Now, this word for observing is to, to pay close attention and to see something with understanding. And the reason why I say that concerning this word is that the noun that this verb is derived from is the word mashkiach. Mashkiach is someone. For example, if you normally hear that, you think of someone who works in a food factory or in a restaurant, and they are to ensure that the kosher laws, cash root in Hebrew, that these laws are properly followed, that they give an assurance. So it's to see something and to understand it with knowledge, and it has to do with certifying. So we're speaking now about Satan's defeat. And those who see it, they are going to look upon you, that is, upon Satan. And unto you, and the next word is yit boninu. This is a word for paying as well great attention to. One, the first verb is looking with understanding. The second word has to do with a, a great scrutiny, paying very great attention to what's taking place. So both of these verbs are used, and it's simply to confirm the reality of what's being said. And who are they speaking about? Well, keep reading. They speak about one. They say, this man, that Margis Haaretz. Margis could be, in this context, the word for causing trembling, being an instrument of, of fear and also displeasure. If we use this word in modern Hebrew, and it appears we use it frequently, if I say, Margizoti, you, you're angering me, you're bothering me. Well, here it speaks about the one who bothered and brought destruction upon the world. And it also says, Mar-ish, Mandachot, which means that he shook or made a great noise. Now, this is also a word that can be used in regard to an earthquake in ancient Hebrew, in the Hebrew of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And it's talking about an earthquake brings destruction. It shakes and destroys. And that's what this man, and who is this man? Well, it's in regard to Satan. But it's probably a reference to Satan and Satan incarnate, that is, the Antichrist. So we're speaking about, in this chapter, Satan will be defeated and the personification of Satan, the Antichrist, he will as well. Verse 17. For he set the world. Now we have the word, word ha'aretz, the land or the earth. We have the word ha'olam, the world. And we also have the word 
teva. And this word, excuse me, the word tevel, which is the word for world in a more of a ancient Hebrew term. So he, he causes the world to be midbar. That's a desert. It's speaking about a place of emptiness. So he set the world as a desert and its cities he destroyed. But what about those who are with him? Now, there's going to be here military terminology that's used. And usually after a, a war ends and that leader has been, been done away with, he's been executed, what happens? Well, usually the prisoners are set free. They may have supported this ruler. They may have been part of his empire, his army. But when they are defeated, they, they usually return home, but not here. If someone is unwise and joins in in a satanic objective, siding with the enemies of God, it says his prisoners, there will not be open to them house, meaning they won't have the opportunity to return home. That, that freedom will never happen. Look at verse 18. And all the kings of the nations, all of them, they, they have lied down with glory, a man in his house. Now here, house, by it, can simply mean a place of habitation. And this is probably, and we'll see this confirmed in a moment, is speaking about a grave. What the scripture is saying is this, that these rulers that are even defeated, and it speaks of a general sense, all the leaders of the world, whether they were evil or not, whether they were successful or not, they, they have a, a degree of, of being famous. There's a degree of, of glory. Now, this word glory can be used in a positive sense or in a negative sense. The word glory is the word kavod, which comes from the Hebrew word kaved, which is heavy. It's related to significance. They had significance. People still go and think about how much they achieved, even if their, their achievement was, was evil. But what it says about Satan, what it says in regard to the one who's going to be carrying out his plan, the Antichrist, is that he is not going to have any glory whatsoever. He's not going to be placed in a tomb that's going to be large or of significance in any way. And we look at some evil rulers like Stalin, and we see that, that they have large shrines, many evil rulers have shrines unto them, but, but not this one. Verse 19, you, and it speaks here about Satan, and you, you will be cast from your grave as a abhorrent a branch. This means a rotten branch. It's a word for an abomination. And this word is chosen because it's uniquely related to the Antichrist and, and his ruler, Satan. So as a branch that is abominable. And how dead ones are clothed, and they are clothed having been, been stabbed or pierced by the sword. So a person's garments, what he's wearing if he's stabbed to death repeatedly, those garments are soiled with, with blood. They are not uh, clean. They are not of glory, of, of a stature. They are shame. So to be scattered with blood, in this sense, is shameful. And they go down, keep reading, the ones who, who go down to the stones of the pit as a corpse, a dead body, which is, your Bible probably says, trampled upon, and that's fine, but it's, it's in modern Hebrew, it's simply the word for being defeated. And what this scripture is saying is that, that the Antichrist, 
Satan, and also those who have joined with him, they are going to go down, being cast out. He will be out of his grave and into that pit, into the abyss. And ultimately, we know from the book of Revelation to that lake that burns with fire and brimstone and sulfur forever and ever. Verse 20. And not be gathered with you in grave. So there's not going to be, and this means there's not going to be simply coming together, these ones who are defeated in their tomb, and that's it. If you wrongly believe, and there is a growing uh, tendency in evangelicalism to believe that eternal life is only for the believer, that they would say, there is no eternal death. There is a judgment which consumes and is over. There is no eternal understanding, recollection for those who have rejected the gospel. They will be consumed in God's judgment, but it will end. That is a false teaching. What this scripture is saying is that this is not the case, that they are not going to be simply made together in the tomb. This is not going to happen. Why? For your land you have uh, uh, corrupted and your people you have killed. And what he's speaking here is this. Satan, he came down into this world. Ultimately, the Antichrist demonstrated what he wanted. And he's going to be judged because he was not a steward, a good steward of what was what was in his possession. God never gave it to him, but he took this world. He was cast out of the heavens, and instead of re repenting, and this idea of being cast out of heaven has to do with harem being set apart. And usually harem is, is given, or karet is given, in order for the purpose of of repentance, like it says in the book of Corinthians, that let this one be, be cast outside, and the proper term is karat, that he be cast outside, cut off from society, that he might repent for the saving of his soul. But, but he's not going to do that. He was cast out of heaven, and what is he going to do? Bring corruption to the land and, and death to the people. And it says... Lo yikare leolam zera meraim. There will not be mentioned forever the seed, the offspring of the wicked ones. So they're not going to have any memory. And when I say memory, I'm talking about any covenantal promise. They're not going to receive the good things of God. There's no hope. There is no uh purpose in anything other than their continual and eternal destruction. So there's going to be nothing for them in the age to come. Verse 21. And they have prepared for their sons, or it was prepared for their sons, their offspring, their children, a slaughter on account of the iniquity of their forefathers. And they will not rise up and inherit the land. And it says, and they fill, they will not fill the face of the world with cities. Now, cities, this growth has to do with prosperity. And Isaiah is using a variety of different terms in order to say they have no future. They will not achieve anything from an eternal standpoint. They will be cut off. There will be no memory, meaning we're not going to remember them. We're going to be focusing in on the promises, the faithfulness of God, remembering the righteous acts of the saints. They are going to be forgotten, but they are going to spend eternity in the condemnation and the eternal judgment and wrath 
of God. Verse 22. I will rise up upon them, says the Lord of hosts, and I will cut, cut from Babylon a name and a remnant and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Actually, it's the other way around. We would say in English, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, but it's flipped in Hebrew, says the Lord. So when he says, I'm going to cut from Babylon, remember in the book of Revelation, Babylon is, is used symbolically for this Antichrist empire. And the reason for that is they wanted to take control of Israel for his purpose. Now, of course, God used it for his own purpose to bring judgment, a limited judgment, 70 years. And then the king of Babylon, as we saw, is going to be punished and destroyed. That Babylonian empire will come to an end. This is what's being brought to the attention of the reader here. In the same way that Babylon did not achieve its goals, that Babylon was cut off, that it had no continuation, in that same way, the Antichrist, this final empire, this one that wanted to wage war with the saints and with Messiah, it's not going to have a, an end. It is going to be cut off eternally. Verse 23, he says, I will set for a, a inheritance, meaning its errant inheritance is a kipod. Now, some Bibles may translate this as an owl. Others, and probably modern Hebrew, it would go with a porcupine. But what it is, is a, an animal that's simply not of any purpose, one that's not utilized. And what he says basically here is that the, the place of, of the Antichrist has no purpose. There's nothing worthwhile. There's nothing of substance from God's standpoint. It is a, a lakes of water, and he says, meaning it's going to be just drouch, drenched, excuse me, drenched in, in water, and water is also a form of judgment biblically, and I will sweep it with a broom of destruction, says the Lord of hosts. And usually that phrase, Lord of hosts, speaks about God in a judgmental context. So all of this is revealed. Now let's go to verse 24. In verse 24, we're going to be speaking about Ashur, which is Assyria. Now we know something. Before Babylon came into being, it was Assyria. Assyria was the enemy, especially the enemy of the northern kingdom, meaning Israel, those nine plus tribes. And Assyria also threatened Judah, the southern kingdom, but did not carry out its plan. We've learned this. It was Babylon. So now Isaiah is showing how God, who has prophesied, we saw that earlier in chapter 7, that Assyria would not be successful but be defeated. He's reminding. In the same way that you have seen this or will see this from his standpoint, in the same way, that you will see that Assyria is not going to be successful. Don't think that the Antichrist, this, this satanic empire, will be successful. So, verse 24. The Lord of hosts swore, saying, Is it not just as I imagine it? Thus it was. And just like I counseled, it was established. Now, do you see how we're moving into a discussion of something that from our standpoint, we can look back at and say God was perfectly correct. His prophecy came about exactly. And in that same way, we glean from this that we can be assured that Satan's going to be defeated. And therefore, why would we want to join a loser? Why would we want to be part of, of his Team. So he says, now verse 25, to be broken is Assyria. Assyria will be broken in my land, meaning he's going to come to his end in the land of 
Israel. Upon the mountains, he will be defeated or tread down and removed from them his, his yoke. From them, those that he's oppressed. He's not going to be successful over the ones that he wanted to enslave. Secondly, his burden is going to be removed from, from their shoulder. It will be taken away. So Assyria, look in the past, was Assyria successful? Did it accomplish its goals? What it went out for? Did it accomplish those goals? And the answer is no. Supernaturally, he was defeated. And therefore, we are reminded of that. Now, it's prophetic in this day, but we're told of that. So when it comes about, we'll say, yes, God speaks truth. Yes, what God has counseled has been established so that we will have confidence and faith and know that that great enemy, Satan, will also be defeated. Verse 26. This is the counsel which has been counseled concerning all the earth. This message is for everyone so that no one should be deceived. Satan is defeated. And he goes on to say, this is the hand that has been stretched out over all the nations. So God's moving. This hand has authority and power. God has the authority and the power to bring it about, and this is over all of his creation. That's what he's saying. Verse 27. For the Lord of hosts, he counsels, he will counsel, and who is able to to thwart this? Who is able to make that void? His hand is stretched out, and who is able to, to return it? Meaning, once God determines, I'm going to do this, and he determines, now I'm going to do it at this time, There's no going back. We can't change the purpose of God. We can't change the activity of God. Once God says yes to something, it's only a matter of time until it is fulfilled. And he's saying this and reminding us from our standpoint, was he right with Assyria? Yes, he was. Is he right with regard to the enemy, that great enemy, Satan? Yes, he is. Now let's move on to our final section, verse 28. Now we know the time that he prophesied this. Now this was before a serious uh, uh, demise. Ahaz was the king. And God offered Ahaz, if we go back to chapter 7, the opportunity to receive counsel and confirmation of that counsel, but he refused it. He didn't trust in God. He wouldn't open himself up to revelation. And because of that, notice what it says. In the year of the death of King Ahaz, he died in disbelief. Came about this burden, this prophetic burden. And it was a burden because there was going to be much destruction. But in the end, God would be victorious. He says in verse 29. Now, he's dealing with Peleshit. Peleshit is another word. We have the word Philistines. And the word Philistines and Peleshit come from the same, same root word in Hebrew. Peleshit is what the term Palestine is also derived from. So it's not just by by accident that we see that the term Palestine, Peleshit, is being used here in regard to an ancient people and a future people, signifying a judgment that was and will be. Look at verse 29. He says, Do not rejoice, Peleshit, all of you. Don't think because Assyria is going to be destroyed that this means that you won't. Don't you rejoice because the the rod was broken that struck you. They also suffered by Assyria. But Assyria's defeat is not going to give them relief. Why? 
because God's going to judge them. God's going to bring his punishment upon them. And notice what he says. Look at the end of verse 29. For from the root of this serpent, speaking of Assyria, from the root of this serpent will come forth a, a, another type of snake, a viper. And his fruit will be, meaning his descendant, will be a, a fiery uh, flying snake. And the word here for flying is the word me'ofef. Me'ofef is just that. The word of is a bird. So this has to do with a flying snake. And usually flying implies something supernatural. So a fiery supernatural enemy. And this is a reference to Satan, meaning this. Of these ones, and Assyria is just a, an example of this. So is Babylon, so is Peleshed. There's many enemies. Egypt as well, Moab, Amnon. All of this is going to be detailed in the weeks to come. God's prophetic truth is most precise. So he says, don't think because Assyria is going to be defeated that it's going to bring you relief. Because a fiery serpent is going to come forth supernaturally. And it says, verse 30, in spite of that, notice he says, the, the firstborn ones of the poor will be fed. And the destitute, they will lie down in safety. And I will kill with famine your root, and your remnant will be killed. Now, what's it speaking about here? We have to understand the literary devices. We need to understand how Isaiah was inspired to use certain devices to teach us something. So we see something that is as a supernatural enemy, this fiery flying serpent. And it says he's going to be defeated. What is going to be one of the consequences of his defeat? Well, those who are afflicted. The ones who have been, who've been impoverished by the enemy. It says they're going to be given good pasture. They're going to be fed. And the ones who are, are we would use the word uh, destitute, they are going to be given rest, lie down. It's the same word for lying down in green pastures from the book of Psalms in Psalm 23. They are going to these ones who have been, who've been afflicted. They are going to, in security, lay down. But he says, I will kill with the famine your root, speaking of the, the Peleshit, the Philistines, the Palestinians, and your remnant, he will kill. Verse 31. Wail at the gate, meaning cry out, and scream, O city, because Peleshit, this is the people in the last days that come from the same spirit of those ancient Philistines. It is a, a reference to a dome as well, Edom. And he says, Peleshit will melt all of you. For from the north, and lots of times north speaks about, about judgment, or that word north can mean hidden, Safun, but this is word Safon, but, but they're interchangeable. So from the north, smoke comes. This is this judgment. Ve and Boded, Boded, in modern Hebrew, if there's a soldier serving in Israel, but he has no family here, Chayal Boded. So this is one who's alone. And in this case, it has to do with one who is missing. And what he says here on that appointed time, and he uses the word here, moad. Now we know the word moed, this is the word moad. It means basically the same thing, an appointed time or an appointed meeting. And this meeting is of judgment. And what God is saying is that there's not going to be anyone missing from this appointed time and appointed place 
of judgment. Verse 32, our last verse. What a great verse of promise. Now he talks about with this judgment of Peleshit of the Palestinians. He says, when that judgment happens, what can we expect? Well, this is parallel in, 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 in context to what we saw in verse 30. So we see in verse 31, something bad, but in verse 32, something good. The same way of back and forth that we saw previously in this last, last section. So this is what he says. And how the kings of the earth he will afflict. But, and here's the good news, the kings of the earth are going to be afflicted. He's going to answer, he's going to respond to, but the Lord in doing just that, he is going to establish Zion, Zion. And I hope you know that Zion is a kingdom word. And this tells us why this verse, see, when we look at it, because some might say critical events towards the interpretation saying, this has nothing to do with the last days. It's speaking about the past. It's already been fulfilled. No, no, and no. And the reason for that is, look at what it says here. The end, the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight verbs, ver words. For the Lord, Isad, Isad will establish, it's from the, the, the Hebrew word for to make a foundation. So the Lord will establish the foundation of Zion, the kingdom, and in it, the afflicted ones. By the enemy is the implication. The afflicted ones of his people, they will find shelter. And this is a kingdom shelter. This is a kingdom promise. So the more you study prophecy, you're going to see how much the prophets, even when they speak about past events, they do so so that we can understand this final transition from this age into the kingdom of God and God's faithfulness that he will display before all the world and to his people in the last days. Well, my advice to you is to go back and study this 14th, 14th chapter. It is a highly significant one. And when you understand it properly and the devices that are used in order to give revelation to the people, from this literary means, it's going to prepare you better to understand the chapters that we're going to be looking at in the weeks to come. Well, I'll close with that. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.